Can I please invite uh, our next panel up? Uh, Carrie Stoddard Smith, Tanya Tefenua, and Andrew Watsina. Um, interesting stories and stories to tell. Uh, that was a good introduction <clears throat> into the next panel. Um, but before doing so, kia ora, kia ora no, koutou katoa. My name is Tani Wayford, I'm a lead advisor in the Trade and Economic Group at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. It is my pleasure to be asked to chair this uh, session with uh, some of my friends. And uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting theme for the day. Leading trade agreements for sustainable futures. And the, the topic for this particular panel is Indigenous trade leadership. There's a lot to unpack out of that. Leading trade agreements, sustainable futures, indigenous trade leadership. Um, speaking of which, I do hope we get to uh, drill into that. What is trade from an indigenous perspective? Uh, how do trade agreements support indigenous development? And what is sustainable from an indigenous perspective? Uh, and now just as well, we've got an uh, expert panel to help us with some of these questions. And the more you hear from them, and the less you hear from me, the better for everyone. Uh, you have their bios uh, in the program. And so uh, in the interest of time, you can look up more about their backgrounds. Um, but to start us off, I'm going to ask them to each introduce themselves. Kia ora koutou, tēnā koe e Kerry. Kia ora, kei a koe. Kia ora koutou, uh, ko Kerry Stoddart Smith tōkuinga. I'm just going to say that Stoddart with a T. Everyone always puts a D, uh, just for future reference. Stoddart with a T, Smith. Uh, he uri tēnei o Ngāpohi me Ngāti Whātua. Um, I'm a descendant of the Ngāpohi and Ngāti Whātua tribes of Aotearoa. Um, I am a newly minted independent uh, trade consultant, um, having recently stepped down from duties on a number of different boards uh, looking at Indigenous trade, uh, to focus on my PhD and to move my business from what it was, doing project consultancy, to an emerging think tank. So <laughs> this is where um, the space that I love, and I'm really excited to be here alongside my esteemed colleagues here. Kilda. Kia ora koutou, tēnā koe, o tira tēnā kōrua tāne rawa ko Kerry. Um, tātou katoa kwa hui tahi mai i tēnei rā i raro, um, i tēnei whare whakaruru haui a tātou i runga i te kaupapa na nui rawa ki a tātou tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou, tēnā rawa atu tātou katoa ko. Tāne a te whenua tēnei e mehi kau anu atu ki a koutou katoa he uri o nai tūhoi me te whakatohia, um, he uri o mā tātua waka, no opotiki, uh, na reira, tēnei taku mihi atu ki a koutou. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to start by thanking uh, Tani and Kerry, who are great friends as well as colleagues of mine in this international trade space, um, for extending the warm welcome to me to be part of the panel, especially um, the School of Public Policy here at um, Auckland University and Jen, who leads that. So, Koto Katoa, MFAT, um, all the sponsors, thank you. Um, all of us here in the room as well. No ma haramai. I am um, a lawyer, so I always put that up and apologise for that in advance. Um, <laughs> and it's through my activity as an advocate, particularly around Māori development, that I've been welcomed into the international trade space. Um, my expertise is with respect to the Treaty of Waitangi. So no matter what you do um, in public policy, you're going to also need to become an expert in that. Um, absolutely, as you know, the Treaty is our nation's founding constitutional document, and it is the basis upon which we really are having this um, discussion here about the space, the place of Indigenous leadership in our um, national trade agenda. And so, with that lens, with my um, background in understanding the partnership approach under the treaty and what that means for engagement with Māori and the Crown, um, I was lucky enough to be invited onto the Taumata, which is a partner of the Ministry for Foreign Affairs and Trade in terms of uh, Māori trade. 
through that, also um, lucky enough to be invited onto the civil advisory group of the Director General of the World Trade Organization, um, and lucky enough to be invited onto the World Economic Forum steering groups for Indigenous trade, which Carrie also sits on, and um, trade and labor. I'm also um, lucky enough <laughs> to be part of the honorary advisors group to our Asia New Zealand Foundation, which is a crown trust who's responsible for ensuring that New Zealanders can competently thrive um, in the Asia in Asia and in those markets as well. So um, other than that, I'm just a mum of four. And so <laughs> big ups to Jane Koronek, another really good friend of ours at the OECD, who's done a lot of work on not only Indigenous, but as you saw, um, gender equity and trade. Kia ora. Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, who, uh, sorry. Uh, e tipo ake a hau ki Pangaroa, uh, ki nga reke reke o taku whaia, um, ko mata tu te waka, ko manga pohatu te moanga, uh, ko tu hoi te iwi. Um, yeah, nō reira, tēnā, uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, my name is Andrew Wātane. Uh, I'm slightly different. I'm not from a law or a, um, uh, a policy background. I'm a business person at heart. Um, essentially, uh, I've been in industry nearly 30 years. Um, 23 of that was, um, was working in industries between New Zealand, Japanese and Irish food groups. 17 of those years away in places like Ghana, India, uh, China, Singapore, Brazil, uh, Ireland, and now back home. Um, where I kind of fit into the puzzle is I work for KPMG now, and I lead our food, agribusiness, and export advisory services in KPMG Propagate. Um, and I have a lot to do with different Māori organizations, mainly in the Trust and Inc. space on um, uh, basically them working in agribusinesses in global markets. So um, my purpose here today is to try and share with you some of uh, what they're doing, where their ambitions are, um, and so that you can take forward into your work, um, perhaps uh, some of what they're doing and, and maybe explore further. So, kia ora. Well, kia ora koutou, and uh, lucky for you, there happens to be a strong mātātua waka uh, <laughs> presence on the panel. <clears throat> Um, we're going to start with you, Carrie. We're going to have a bit of a um, bit of a conversation um, with you all, and I'm going to ask each of them to, to make some comments and also pose some questions to you because we want this to be interactive. We do want an opportunity at the end to hear from you. Uh, we want to uh, challenge and give you some, um, some food for thought. Uh, but starting with you, Carrie, um, we met in 2019, 2020, and uh, since then, I uh, have done a lot with you. You've been very busy. Uh, opportunity for you to, to tell us some of those things that you've been up to. Oh, kia ora tane. Um, I think the first thing that I wanted to say is Indigenous trade policy is so new. I don't know if any of you know, but when I was doing my master's in 2014, <laughs> there was no literature at all for me to go in and do anything <laughs> um, on the topic. So it was, I was told that I was entering a novel and I was a novel area that I was very brave to be entering. Um, but at that time, if I reflect back, New Zealand had just signed Chapter 19 of the ANZTEC Agreement. So that was the first Indigenous cooperation uh, chapter that there is in a trade agreement kind of ever. Um, and that's 10 years, and I think the actual signing date is coming up on December the 13th. So that's really soon. Um, but since then, and in the background, there's actually been a lot going on, and I think a lot of it has been kind of muffled under a lot of the, um, the, the kind of the bigger noise. Uh, so everyone will be familiar with the TPPA and the 40,000 strong protests that took place um, across the country. It resulted in a lack of bipartisan support um, and saw a breakdown in New Zealand's social licence to even have FTAs. Um, it also culminated in a Waitangi Tribunal claim um, and that was the kind of the impetus for Ngātuki Whakarururanga um, and their forming their, um, I guess, their treaty partnership with MFAT as well. But behind the scenes, I think some of the stuff that I think needs to be celebrated is that 
In 2010, New Zealand actually signed up to the UNDRIP, which should be celebrated because that was signed up under a national government and we're coming back into a national government and I know everyone's worried about those politics around what does that actually mean? It's like, well, they actually through while they had their partner, the Māori Party at that point, and Peter Sharples was the face, what we recently learned at the NZIIA conference was that actually Chris Finlayson was kind of some of the big muscle behind getting that all signed up and over the line with Cabinet. Um, from there, we did, as I was saying, we saw the ANSTEC um, we saw the continued um, negotiation inclusion of the Treaty of Waitangi Exception Clause, problematic from a Ngātoki point of view, which we might talk about later, but it, it still it's something, it, it talks about the progress New Zealand's continued to make in the Indigenous trade space. Um, but also alongside that, we saw Māori businesses engaging in what, we, what they called at that point ministerial Māori trade missions. So we had Peter Sharples taking delegations to China, uh, we had them taking them to the Pacific Islands. We had them going to um, under Tiruroa, then to Japan, Korea, Singapore, Malaysia. So there's been a lot of work that's been going on with Māori businesses engaging um, in trade since then. And so I think when we got the previous government, what we saw was um, a lot stronger um, influence on how that Indigenous um, element would start to play out because the foundations had been set. And so from those foundations, we did see um, MFAT take a, a lead role in including Māori and in APEC, the Māori Success Strategy Programme, which I worked with Tani on um, through, through starting to get that stood up. And really actually understanding that, you know, across the Asia-Pacific, 476 million Indigenous people across this region, yet where was our voice? You know, we had our voice been for that, that, that long. We were growing businesses um, and we were exporting, um, and some of us at variable stages. So I think there's those things, but it really did ramp up in the last five years with the IPETCA, so the Indigenous Peoples Economic and Trade Cooperation Arrangement. I want to make two points about that agreement. The first is there's actually a definition that was drafted by Indigenous people that defines what Indigenous trade and investment looks like from an Indigenous lens. Um, that was drafted by, I think, Indigenous people from Australia, from New Zealand and from Canada. Um, and I believe there was input from Chinese Taipei into that as well. Um, but the other amazing part about that agreement is the institutional provisions. So the um, incorporation of a partnership council for the first time ever where you've got government and Indigenous representatives sitting at that same table together making decisions about how that agreement is going to be implemented um, and what's going to be prioritised. And I think it's really fascinating that at a domestic level, we're still having fights about co-governance, but at a plurilateral level, we already got it over the line. So there's nothing to actually be afraid of, and we need to be able to demonstrate why those kind of models are really important. Um, and I know that Tanya will speak more to these things as well, but there was also the Māori trade and economic cooperation chapters in both the UK FTA um, and in the EU FTA. And while there are obviously there's some, some challenges with both those things, I think the continuous improvement and focus and prioritisation of Māori and Indigenous rights in these agreements really starts setting the standard around the world. And what we've seen is even in a, the US MCA, they got an Indigenous rights protection in there to kind of reflect what Māori and New Zealand were already doing um, with the Treaty of Waitangi exception. And we saw a similar exception then rolled out recently between an agreement with the US and Chinese Taipei as well. So th there's this growing background movement um, and New Zealand should be really proud of the role that it's played in being able to kind of keep that momentum um, and hopefully we, through, the, um, through these agreements and the way that it's um, rippling around the world, we're actually going to be able to see that these things are going to withstand whatever the political winds bring. So I'm just going to stop there because I'm mindful <laughs> of talking forever. I could go on forever. <laughs> um, but I will stop there just so that other people can have a, a, a chance to add on to that as well. Kia ora. Thank you for that, um, Carrie. There's actually a lot that we can um, dig into, but thank you very much for... Um, giving us a quick um, scan um, of the of the waterfront, the landscape over that's been developed over recent years. Uh, just a, a word on the IPETCA. I'm not sure if it's been mentioned uh, today, but uh, the IPETCA held their inaugural partnership council meeting. That's between government and indigenous participants on the IPETCA 
in San Francisco last week. A lot of work was, uh, was done establishing that partnership council and they held their, this was big news people, they held their inaugural partnership council in San Francisco last week. It's a, it really is um, a significant achievement um, that was held on the Monday and then the following day uh, was the indigenous trade dialogue with APEC ministers. Uh, we're seeing things that we talked about uh, wanting to see uh, a number of years ago. Speaking of which, Yeho, am I al allowed to say how long I've uh, known you? <laughs> well, about 20 years, um, taking us back to um, our law school days. Um, you have also been uh, very much a part of this mahi. Uh, you mentioned earlier te taumata. Uh, you were also in San Francisco uh, for the... Um, Again, inaugural APEC uh, multi-stakeholder forum. We're seeing lots of firsts. Jane spoke before about an inaugural, you know, there is lots happening uh, in OECD. Over to you to talk about uh, what some of these things mean from, uh, from an indigenous leadership perspective. Kayakwe. Thank you. I might just pick up on the most recent experience, which was the APEC inaugural multi-stakeholder forum, which was organised by the US Secretariat for, as hosting um, state for APEC this year, um, to bring together non-government, um, not already identified business leaders, uh, 300 different key stakeholder representatives from worker or employee communities from business or employer communities to talk about um, this topic of transitioning to a sustainable economy, a greener transition, from indigenous um, representative groups of, we were part of a delegation from New Zealand, Canada, America, um, and Peru. So it's quite a big, as Tani said, quite a big deal that America was front-footing this and um, inviting all these various gender key stakeholder representatives as well. Um, plethora of different voices into the dialogue to, um, to be able to collectively have a voice that would then, was then shared up to um, leaders. So not only did we have the IPECTA um, inaugural council meeting, but we had at the same time this different forum where many, many other um, indigenous representatives had collectivized and we formed our own statement. Um, it was sort of like a compact, uh, our vision for further engagement in, into APEC as indigenous people um, and to be able to have, to continue those conversations in that dialogue in a way which has never ever been done before. So. Um, that we are at a um, turning point, we're at the precipice of something amazing, not only because of the urgency with which change is required, but at the same time, um, what is happening is the recognition that people outside of the um, ideologies that have got us to the point where we're at with respect to um, the need to transition have wisdom, and indigenous people in particular have intergenerational wisdom, that is um, that we want to share for the benefit of everybody uh, to help us to move forward. So, um, sort of the catchphrase that was being espoused at the um, inaugural multi-stakeholder forum was: um, "Those those people who got us here should not alone be the ones who take us forward." And I think that's um, the beauty of not only not only um, gender diversity all of these different collective voices, but also the fresh um, perspective that you as new generation policymakers, we hope will come through and bring. Um, so this, this aspect of, if we come back to a principled approach under the Treaty of Waitangi, which is my area expertise and what will underpin your framework, the framework within which you operate um, public policy in New Zealand, we talk about what, what we're really seeing in effect at a global level and also at a domestic level within the international trade and policy um, forum is partnership for all of those principles which you know and learn about, but in particular mutual benefit. Um, so it's the values-based approach that Māori um, approach things like trade, uh, business practice, uh, 
with that we're willing to lend to build the economy of New Zealand and to change the way in which we approach um, business in New Zealand. I was, um, again, lucky enough um, to listen to Associate Reserve Bank Governor Christian Hawkesby present a presentation to the Institute of Directors 2021 um, annual general meeting, and that speech was entitled The Future of New Zealand is Māori. Um, I don't know if you've yourself uh, read the speech, it's freely available online, but he said, uh, when I talk about the future of New Zealand being Māori, I'm not talking about the Māori economy, which is a significant contributor to the New Zealand economy. We're talking now about an economy estimated at 68 billion, and that's a prudent estimation depend on how, depending on how you measure your balance sheet. I'm not talking about uh, Māori people, Just I'm not just talking about Māori people, I'm not talking about Māori Business assets, I'm talking about Māori values. He said, um, in the changing society within which we live, where the environment, where social objects, where community is more important, all of these aggregate outcomes that Jane was talking about, then individual wealth and it, um, the basic shareholder model or the capitalist system, he said Māori values have a lot to lend toward growing New Zealand values, the New Zealand way. And what we see in the global um, context is that New Zealand is also looked at as a leader um, to help the world shift toward a more sustainable model for economic growth and international trade. And it's for that reason, um, it's specifically for that reason that when we get into these fora like APEC, like the WTO New Zealand, um, Leaders in this space are looked to for their leadership to grow, to grow the global um, agenda around this. Um, so, so I just want to impress upon you, if, you haven't, if you're not already aware of it, um, the significant role that we play, both domestically and at an international level. Um, it's a source of great pride. It should be a source of great pride, not only for us as Māori, but for us as um, New Zealanders. Thank you very much, um, Tanya. There's lots of uh, rich corridor uh, in there. Uh, you talked a little bit about uh, some of those values, uh, mutual benefit and, sorry. Partnership. Partnership. Can I give Partnership. one um, example, Tanya, before you move on to Anaru? Um, to give some, yeah, to demonstrate um, what I'm talking about in a practical sense. So the Tomata, one of the partners that MFAT works with to um, ensure that they are partnering well with Māori in terms of the international trade agenda, but also in terms of developing our international trade instruments, um, has a values-based approach, a Māori values-based approach. So one of the examples of that is that we often say we are relational and not just transactional. H hands up who's heard that before. Um, and of course, relational is going to be big in um, a diplomatic context, but we as Te Taumata made sure that we went out directly, so we kind of, with the support of MFAT, but not waiting on MFAT, ensured that we were making our own diplomatic relationships with um, the diplomatic corps in New Zealand. At the time of um, that we were negotiating the UK FTA, NZ UK FTA and the EU FTA, we were ensuring. Um, and it's lovely to see Maria Lowe also here in the room, um, our Can Canadian Trade Commissioner in New Zealand. Again, Canada's a big um, friend of ours and trading partner, and we've also developed strong relationships with um, our Canadian embassy. But so we, as to Tomata, we're going out ensuring that we're making our own um, strong relationships. These were really critical in helping, for example, at the time of the UK FTA, our... UK Diplomatic Corps, um, our British High Commissioner to New Zealand, to understand the significance and the importance of the Māori economy to New Zealand's economy, which, which she um, has shared with us, she was able to relay back to her colleagues to help them to understand then the significance and importance of the Māori economic um, trade chapter in the UK FTA to New Zealand. Without it, so. Um, from our perspective, without that relationship, there's a, there's a risk that that may not have been conveyed as well as it ha 
could have been from the voices of Māori themselves. As Te Taumata, we did a lot of lobbying around the importance of Māori being at the table in this partnership model. Um, and I think Tane, you're another really key example of that because Tane um, herself is now one of our key negotiators and, um, and a very successful one at that. And under Tane's leadership within MFAT as a key negotiator, we have seen so much gains. I have to cut you off now. Oh. <laughs> we can't, I'll have to leave it there. But um, the EU FTA is the perfect, able to be publicly known example of that. <laughs> <laughs> Kia ora motera, um, e hoa. Yeah, no, good point to, uh, to cut you off. Um, and think, again, um, so much to, to, to drill into, particularly the relational element. We've had discussion already this morning around uh, uh, a bit of a, a trade review, trade strategy review from a commercial perspective, but where does the relational come in? Uh, how does indigeneity um, uh, perspectives, indigenous perspectives, uh, uh, influence and impact on that assessment. Um, now, going over to you, um, Andrew, and I hope you're um, hope we're, we're sparking off ideas because we will come to you shortly. Um, uh, but just to maximise our time, we talked a little bit about putting off Tanya's comments. Uh, partnerships and mutual benefit. You work with uh, through KPMG Propagate. Um, various entities, organisations, trusts and corporations. Uh, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? What are they telling you? I think it was probably your humility that cut it off there because you, um, you didn't want to hear about how well you're doing. So Just the mihiti. So. Um, I think to extend on both of the earlier points, just some examples of work that Māori are doing in international markets. Um, I think, you know, again, just to give context, my background is, um, is working in industry. In the 23 years that I was working in industry, this never happened to me, and this is why it sort of really stands out in my mind. Typically, when you're working with a bunch of retailers across the globe, you have this situation where it's highly competitive. It's kind of get your elevator pitch, you've got 10 seconds, that's a bit exaggerated, but you've got... You've got a very limited time to make your point and try and be able to get enough of a hook to be welcomed back. Um, we worked with the Māori organisation to take them, um, who, they've created this phenomenal product. Um, they had it validated both onshore and offshore in a science context. And what they were looking to do was trying to find partners um, that actually could go through to end consumers. And um, so we, we organised ourselves in a way where we had a governor, we had a science guy and a commercial guy. And um, the governor just spoke purely around purpose. This is why we exist. This is our construct. In the New Zealand context, it's this. Um, you know, our whole purpose of being is to look after our uri or our people. And uh, so we probably make different decisions to your typical supplier and just so you understand us, this is what we're about. So that already got, and it got them intrigued. Then when we talked about the actual product and the attributes, that was kind of arbitrary because it's um, similar to everyone else. And then we said to the commercial guy, your role is to say nothing. Your role is to ask really good open-ended questions about what value that creates in this situation. And for the first time in my career, it wasn't, um, pull through the cat flap, uh, bring five million euro and you can get listed. It was, my goodness, just go back. You sound like a social entrepreneur, uh, social enterprise. We go, no, no, this is a commercial entity, but it exists probably more for social purposes in your mind. That's because you don't quite understand what it is. But let's go through, let's take the time. And what turned from a half hour meeting turned into a three hour meeting. And probably 90% of the time was explaining the construct of the organisation and why it exists. Then what happened was they rolled out the heads of strategy. So this organisation, I'm sorry, I can't give names, but this organisation um, had everything from premium retail to value uh, retail. It had convenience and then it had pharmacy. So for this client, they actually got a three in one. And it was phenomenal to see them roll out the heads of strategy and start to share why they do, so why Māori do this and this particular entity, 
and where they see the future. And so why values is important, I think, if you find the right organisations who can actually you go through the same lot of questions to multiple kind of opportunities, there's an opportunity actually to find ones that are more aligned where you can com combine resource and capability to safely navigate into the future if you're making some of those big bets. And maybe this is where it comes into policy is that they're also open to, if these types of organisations exist, we should be prioritising this over others because actually it's, it's trying to achieve um, pressure that we're getting from consumers on how we should behave throughout our value and supply chains. And I guess why it's so important to me is that for the first time in my career of 23 years, six years now with KPMG, it was the first time that I'd seen actually the, the opportunity to really flex the op model um, change. And then if you think about it, we get to lean into these chunky um, conversations around fair value distribution in value chains. We get to think about flexing our export op models. We get to think about flexing export pricing models. And so there's lots and lots of tremendous opportunity available. Two other factors to share succinctly is that um, work that we did with the WBCSD, so I have permission to use WBCSD's name, they commissioned us to do an engagement with uh, big food and big retail. And, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, big food and big retail. And the, um, we, we asked questions, and this is bought for, from Atiho, which is a client who's also given us permission, where they asked a simple question, and it sort of flexed the rigidity of our thinking, where if we're thinking in maramataka, if, if sustainability is such a critical issue, why can't we be changing um, commercial cycles to meet lunar cycles? So that whenever we are growing food to either feed people or create energy, why can't we be you know, tackling these kind of questions? And it's not for this forum, but uh, the, the, the response was, yeah, we need to get F and serious about really understanding what it actually means if we are to change to, to look at these things. Other things available for Māori at the moment that, you know, Atiho again doing, looking at rongo and things like animal welfare. You know, animal welfare is a really contentious issue, you know, for consumers um, and our clients. So um, the other thing that I think is really putting a spotlight on us in, in my work, um, you know, I guess what I'm seeing is Things like Māori putting legal status on natural assets is just mind-blowing to a lot of people in a lot of markets. And they're saying, what does that mean? Like, why do they do that, et cetera, et cetera? And then I defer them to clients who have better skill sets for that than I. But there's also frameworks um, that uh, the likes of TNFDs, TIFDs, which are still taking shape, so the Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosures and Task Force for um, Inequity-Related Financial Disclosures are pushing people towards, um, you know, Māori, and actually there's value there in being able to articulate what we do and why, and so as you're going forward in your roles, you know, please, please have a look at some of these and and you know, if you want working examples of um, some of the work we're doing with our clients, I'm happy to connect you or share with you with their permission. But um, it's just the start of a conversation, I think. Hilda. Awesome, thank you very much. And so with our um, sort of less than 10 minutes or so, I'm sure there are some questions on the floor and I'm looking for hands to go up. To Puni. Microphone to Tipuni. Kia ora, kia ora. Kia ora, 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 uh, being at the table for APEC, IPEF, um, and those kind of discussions. And uh, Andrew spoke about being in front of the right people and being able to share those stories. 
Um, a lot of the reports I've read internally, whether it's third party, um, for a lot of these government organisations is around building multi-capacity um, and capabilities. I guess from all of your different areas of expertise, where do you see the most gap to bridge in terms of how do we build multi-capabilities, uh, capacities, and um, yeah, how do we go about doing that? Because I'm very passionate about that and I'd like to make a difference at MFAT, so um, if you guys could yeah, inform my, my direction. Kia ora. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to hand that one to Tanya to start. <laughs> um, but I, I guess from, from my perspective, having been a public servant, so I was at Te Puni Kōkiri for quite a, a few years before I went out and started on my own. And in terms of capacity, um, what I find the biggest struggle at the public service in the international and the trade space is the level of attrition that happens within the public servants, the amount that people move around in their roles, um, and so you lose a lot of institutional knowledge um, from, from each of those teams every time. So I think when I stepped out of TPK, for instance, there was a team there doing international and slowly that team <laughs> eroded to the point where when I was engaging them again, they were then contracting me in to do stuff that I'd been doing before because there wasn't the same uh, level of um, institutional knowledge. So I really think what's important is that agencies learn to understand how to retain that talent, but how to not, I guess it's retain it and grow it um, and nurture it, uh, don't kind of stifle it, you know, like don't think that it can get to one point and that's it and we're not going to grow it anymore. Um, allow people to be... Um, for me personally, I would like to see people step outside the public sector, like have a brief sabbatical, go into a community and then come back with that fresh, refreshed knowledge of knowing how the systems work, but then being able to constantly uh, reconnect back to the communities that your policy is impacting. Um, because I think for, from a New Zealand perspective, with our Indigenous kind of, we talk about Indigenous policy, but really for the most part we're talking about um, Māori like when we're talking about it here, but actually at an MFAT perspective, you're actually going out into the world and you're engaging in the Pacific um, with Japan, with the Ainu, you know, like with lots of different countries. So it's, um, I, I would love to see more um, capacity building in those communities where you're wanting to have an impact with, with your policy, um, but you're yeah, really nurturing that talent while it's there. Just quickly on... Carrie's first point, nurturing talent. Um, one of the things that I really try to um, support our Crown agencies with is the understanding of needing to be strategic in terms of a treaty principled approach um, as a responsible partner acting in accordance with its own constitutional framework. What that means is that um, in one case that we saw, which re, which um, relates to altrition, um, everybody in the organisation, in, in a strategic manner, needs to know and understand the value of a treaty partner, to, a treaty principled approach, not only to the organisation as a whole, but to them um, as leaders of their portfolios, and to then to be able to express that down to their team. Um, with one particular uh, ag agency that we worked with, they had a really um, laudable approach to building internal capacity, wanting to bring in more Māori, um, to build internal Māori capability. We loved that. Um, however, without everybody in the organisation knowing and understanding the benefit of that, um, the risk was, and what we saw happen, was that they came in and then they didn't feel that the organisation as a whole was on the kaupapa, as we say, um, in Māori, so then they quickly left. And that undermined, you know, it was like a rotating door because you couldn't retain the staff. Um, so the best way to uh, approach that, my sort of policy advice, again, is to be, for um, the Crown and government agencies to be strategic um, about their adoption of a principled approach under the Treaty of Waitangi so that there's an overriding strategy, everybody knows their place within it, as leaders within the organisation, the benefit of that strategy to their portfolio, so they can then also manaki, if we're going to use those values in our, you know, agency um, value statements, all of this Māori and incoming Māori capability, which is just one objective under the overriding strategy. Yeah. So that's so here you ha we have to get more sophisticated about our um, part 
principled approach under the Treaty of Waitangi, but that's okay. We are adults, um, you know, um, in terms of the maturity of our approach towards this thing, the treaty. 1975, Treaty of Waitangi Act, 1985, Treaty of Waitangi Amendment, which enabled um, significant milestones, as you know, retrospective claims under the treaty. Since 85, we've been taking this seriously as a country. It's not in terms of our maturity towards what do the principles mean, what does partnership mean. That's not a long time um, in the scheme of things. That's within my lifetime, probably not within all of your lifetimes, but many of our lifetimes. So that's a stone's throw ago, really. So we've, we can celebrate how far we've come, but sophisticated evolution um, is the way forward. Can I just add like another little bit to that, just because there are some public service agencies at the moment that are um, looking at building statements of commitment around the Treaty of Waitangi, and part of that has come from um, whether, you know, it's outward looking, are our funding mechanisms able to build Māori capacity outside of what level of commitment as agencies are we having in those spaces? And I think one of the key areas that I found working with some departments that were creating these Treaty of Waitangi statements of commitment was actually about the consistency of language as well that's being used across uh, the public sector because one of the things that I find is everyone's got a strategy <laughs> And it's um, mostly the same, but then there's these different things that, that change. Whereas if you had that consistency of language, then it didn't matter where the talent moved around the public sector, um, the, the strategy was still going to be the same. And the other thing that I found about the consistency of language is, um, is about being strategic. So what, quite often when I was thinking just before the WTO, um, ask questions of the New Zealand team around the JSI on e-commerce. And part of that was looking for examples in domestic policy where we could demonstrate a commitment to uh, the treaty and how that kind of looked in policy. And um, I think part of what we need to do as a public servant, well, not a public servant, but what you need to do as a public service is actually to get that language that's sitting in some of these agreements. So I found that taking borrowing language from, say, the IPETCA and repurposing it in the statement of commitment, it was MB's statement of commitment, and being able to just, um, you know, that provides future examples of what our general public morals are starting to look like. So I think we can get strategic about building that capacity. And when the language is consistent, then everyone starts acting consistent and you no longer necessarily need to be having a new Māori strategy for capacity and capability every year or every change of government. Um, with one eye on the shot clock, but also another eye on the organisers, I might just give the last word to Andrew. Um, just to take your question um, into some of the clients that I work with, and, and again, it's maybe only a small representation, but I see some of the challenges around um, capabilities is probably capacity. Um, we have a lot of clients trying to pull forward the words of their tūpuna to guide the overall purpose of their organisation and get that really clear, um, but then being able to drive the sustainability of their culture beyond themselves and beyond the generation after them, so it's more of a systemic flow. Um, so just having young ones around to be able to pass that knowledge from one to the next in, in some of my client conversations is a real challenge. Um, a real masterstroke, though, was actually um, Renata Blair at BNZ, including uh, culture in a sustainably linked loan. You know, it costs money to be able to pass this knowledge from one to the next. So to include such a, a component into a sustainably linked loan, which was largely environmental, I felt was a masterstroke. So that, that's what I see. Yeah. Kilda. Well, actually, I'll reserve the last word for myself. Um, not sure if you know, but this is actually an advertorial uh, to do a rotation or to spend some time in the Trade and Economic Group. Um, a lot has been achieved, thank you very much, over recent years um, with our, um, our whanaunga, with our treaty partners. And uh, New Zealand's leadership has really come to the fore. Uh, of that, we can be proud um, together. Uh, I do want to acknowledge, take this opportunity to acknowledge our Deputy Secretary who has led this, not just supporting this policy school, this trade and economic policy school, but a lot of the work that's been achieved with um, Māori and Indigenous uh, trade and economic interests. 
Can I please invite you all to give a warm round of applause to our expert panel? Thank you very much. It's real easy to kind of skip or bypass actually things and be counterproductive what you're actually trying to do. It's a great question from Carrie, and it sparked. Um, it reminded me of a series of quotes that we heard recently at the APEC multi-stakeholder forum. So I wanted to find them um, and share those with you. So remembering that the forum was about transitioning a just transition towards a more sustainable future. Um, and the indigenous representatives that spoke, a collection of their quotes, I put it together and it, it came together like this. For them, um, the forum was more about aiming to ensure that a just transition, because the jury was out as to what just transition actually meant. And there was quite a bit of discussion and questioning around, can you define just transition? Um, so for our indigenous representatives, for them a just transition is not just the same old wine in a different wine bottle. And that, again, the ideologies that got us to where we are today cannot be the only ones that take us forward. For they have experienced that those upstream have little concern for what happens downstream from them. So really um, reminded me of Carrie's point. Uh, for us as Indigenous people, the question around what just transition means um, so just to give you some context, there was a lot of discussion on whose right was right. Is it my right as an employee to ha still have a job after this just, just transition to a greener economy, which um, inevitably is going to use more technology? Or is it my right as a business, lead, uh, business representative and leader to still have a business after this just transition? Is it my right as an Indigenous person to still have an Indigenous culture, <laughs> you know, to call my own, um, to base my identity on? Well, for us as Indigenous people, um, the question around what is just, as Māori in particular, shifts from um, what is just to probably what is tika, which you no doubt know and understand is the root word of tikanga, which you've heard in the context of our customs, our protocols, our etiquette, our value sets. The word tika means right. Um, so for us, it should be a shift in um, focus away from whose rights are right to what is right. And that comes back again to Carrie's question. If we're focusing on sustainability, we need to look, we really, I think, again, a sophisticated approach to dig right down and figure out um, what is right in terms of a sustainable approach. Are we just shifting, as one of our Native America, American um, friends said, are we just shifting from one um, finite resource to another finite resource in terms of energy creation? And the, for them, it was the mining of silica, I think, for solar panels. Are we just shifting our focus from one finite resource to another finite resource? Um, is that really sustainable? Is that really just? And is that really right? For our communities, that's not right. Um, and that's not sustainable either. The other thing that was mentioned in this um, forum was if we look at the trajectory of how much energy we, we're going to need, even if we just take a shift to um, green vehicles and electric cars, we can't, it's most likely that we don't have enough natural resources to produce the energy that we will need to run the same economic model on electric vehicles. So we're, that trajectory in and of itself is scary. Um, so coming back to, I think, um, Carrie's question is, what is the analysis that we're doing as a country? What is the analysis that we're doing um, as a global community? And what is the analysis that you will hopefully drive? Um, the ability that you can, in your own roles, influence to really dig down into looking around what sustainable means to us as New Zealand, um, because it cannot simply be the same old wine in a different wine bottle. The answer is not to shift from one finite resource to another. Yeah.
Cool. And I just wanted to add the reason that that question, I wanted to put that question, sorry, Andrew, was just because what we're finding in the Indigenous trade policy space is there seems to be like this thing around Indigenous chapters, but actually we want to see Indigenous trade policy infused across trade agreements, informing what New Zealand's definitions around sustainable development um, look like, informing what um, kind of those deeper kind of issues are, so that when we go out to the world, we don't go out to the world as, here's the Crown's view, but Māori think that. We go out to the world culturally confident that this is what we believe as one nation, you know, because we've done the research together and we understand what those impacts mean um, at that really deep level. So that's, that's the hope that we have, the big aspiration that we want all of you as graduates to continue to drive um, and, and, and do, because I just don't, I don't want to see that here's this view of what sustainability is um, but Māori have this different view and they don't join because actually if you're going to talk about sustainability it's going to align with Māori values. Uh, I think just to share some of our conversations Māori and non-Māori of what um, clients and clients boards or execs ask of us or they're, they're typically always looking at what are the critical systems in the world and uh, over the last few months, and, and I think there'll be an announcement come out of the UK soon, and um, half a billion dollar investment at looking at how you turn food loss into, um, not here in New Zealand, sorry, offshore, um, how you turn food loss, because not all of it can ca be captured and, and reinterjected into um, to the food system, but um, for landowners as a whole, how do you capture food loss and turn that into energy? Because the, the tagline was, um, energy can't be food, but food can't be energy. And that's not saying taking food, available food out of mouths of um, a food insecure world. It's, the, it's acknowledging that actually food loss is a real issue where in food production. So maximising that instead of you know, doing what Tanya talked about, which was the, are we, or the, the question from um, the friends in the US was, um, instead of taking one finite resource and replacing it with another, looking at actually these cyclical systems of growing food, the loss, and what that creates. There's lots of conversations around effluent, there's lots of conversations in and around food loss, but it's not compartmentalised even more as to how energy could be re-injected back into our systems. There's also been some really interesting, um, uh, what I would say, into iwi lending and around sustainability initiatives when banks aren't necessarily the option and actually sometimes the better option is to work together looking at sustainable energy um, opportunities and while one might finance the other, the res residual energy that's produced is actually offered back to the other iwi um, uh, at a much cheaper rate in which, you know, their Udi can actually avail of those, those cheaper options. So, yeah, there's lots of quite cool conversations and initiatives that are going on that aren't always visible. Yeah, I mean, can I um, apologise again for my extreme efficiency and, uh, and thank the panel for uh, expertly bringing it, bringing it back. Um, uh, Tanya, at the, uh, the forum, we had a very strong Aotearoa representation, didn't we? Uh, about 10 or so, um, um, and, and a very strong uh, Māori uh, presence on that, on that delegation. Um, really touched by the, the kōrero up there and, and the quote that you read out, uh, which brings up um, a good point for us, uh, going back to, the, to today's theme, leading trade agreements. Uh, for sustainable futures and indigenous trade leadership. Um, how do we, using the trade agreements or the mechanisms or the processes or the organizations, um, how do we work within those in order to bring uh, uh, an indigenous uh, leadership approach uh, to, I guess, activate uh, those provisions within a trade agreement or in a, in a or in a regional organisation. Um, yeah, how how do we implement uh, a lot of these uh, policies 
to ensure that those indigenous approaches come forward. I'm going to start and then um, defer to my friends. I know that they're going to have a different way of coming at this, which is also going to be beneficial to you. Um, but I just wanted to ensure that the messaging um, lands well and that when we're talking about indigenous leadership, um, I started the conversation from a treaty principled uh, perspective in terms of partnership for mutual benefit. And so we always say what's good for Māori is good for all New Zealanders, what's good for Indigenous people is going to inevitably be good for the world because our value sets are not exclusively only good for us. You know, this holistic idea of um, what well-being looks like, this holistic idea of what development looks like um, is a model which we're seeing iterated now in policy spaces in terms of trade for all and um, the benefits of trade for all. So the benefits of trade filtering down for all. So reminding us of these basic um, models, which I'm sure you've all heard before, but we like to think about one analogy for economic development is development as a whole, um, where economic development or the tangible physical benefit is only one element of a house with four walls. It has to also have a social benefit um, a collective benefit to the full community. Uh, it also has to have a spiritual benefit. So um, there's the physical, but there's also the, how does it affect our, th these are significantly emotive topics, actually. Um, they're not just emotive to us as Māori, but our relationship with the natural environment is one which um, is shared and is not exclusive to Māori. So when you see um, one element of the natural environment being, you know, p plundered and and um, it, it raises emotions within you that are not exclusive to Māori, but we, they're heightened emotions because coming back to that relational approach, we believe we have a um, genealogical relationship to our natural environment. So it's just as if I see someone um, doing something to one of those four kids that I mentioned at um, the start of this introduction. So, you know, we, um, based on, so I've said physical, uh, mental, economic and social, you know, um, you, the pathway for a sustainable trade agenda for us as Māori would be one which balances the imperatives of all of those things. Where you can clearly see how that's going to benefit not just us as Māori, um, but us as all New Zealand, um, New Zealanders. And I will now defer to my friends um, to speak about how, in a practical sense, we can leverage off. When you're espousing messages like that, I think it becomes difficult for others to deny um, that that's going to be a positive approach. And then how do we, as Tani said, leverage off the mechanisms mm. in place to realise those? Cool. Just to, um, yeah, to build on that, like 100% <laughs> agree. Um, the, the things that I would, would add in there is resourcing. And I'm not saying, please just throw money at us. I am, but I'm not. <laughs> um, the point is, is that in it, order yeah. to do anything right, you need to be resourced. So we need to get, again, smart and sophisticated about how do we resource these things we want to do? What level of skin in the game do we as Māori have to actually put in the game? Because we can't, you know, just always go, we want to be resourced to do some stuff. There's our businesses out there who are willing to put skin in the game to do some stuff to implement those agreements. So I think there's there's like kind of the two-pronged approach. One really is when it's commercial, they will drive that themselves, and Andrew will talk about that. But when there's a social and cultural thing, that's where we need that little bit of support so that we can make those connections because even when the people we're trying to connect with often um, also need that resourcing so we can come together and have those kind of conversations. The other part about the implementing um, and leveraging things is the decision-making. You know, the decisions are often happening in, in, in Cabinet and in Parliament, they're not happening where the decisions need to be happening. So we need to empower and have mechanisms that create decision making at a really local level if we want um, to have truly responsive um, results and outcomes and impacts at our local level. Um, because it, when we think about it from that Māori perspective, it's our ahika who are looking after our environment. They're the ones that know the lay of the land. They're the no ones that know how that water's flowing. They're the one that knows how that weather 
weather is happening and what those patterns are looking like over time. So it's them that I think um, are often left out of those pictures because they don't understand how trade agreements can impact them when they're not exporting because all we talk about is trade only matters if you're an exporter and that's not true and it's not true when you start seeing what our agreements um, are about there. And the other one, I think, is really about supporting those networks. So that's bringing together that decision making um, and the the, and the resourcing is that those networks really matter and I think what we've started to see and as Tanya was alluding to having been over in San Fran is that all those things where we turn up at these forums, they are all about um, building our networks and being able to uh, continue conversations and create consistent conversations because the last thing and the thing that's been the most frustrating, I think, even in the global space, is constantly having to repeat yourself to new audiences, constantly having to relitigate the same arguments after a decade. So those networks are really, really important now and I think we're starting to see that change and I think that digital enablement and that um, digital mobility has really made a difference. So how do we get more indigenous people connected um, digitally so we can have those conversations where we can't be in the same place at the same time? Before we go to Andrew, I might just scan the room again for uh, one last question. Andrew. Uh, I guess my take on it is probably more a question than a question that I try and keep in mind. And it's like, what do we think is unassailable but may not be? So when we're thinking of trade-related activities or um, policy, it's... Um, it's really important to keep that in mind because we might be inadvertently taking opportunity away to create a sustainable um, opportunity, a sustainable, um, profitable growth um, with, um, with bringing more of the component of indigeneity into trade. There's some pretty phenomenal opportunities going between Māori and non-Māori, Māori themselves. Um, and, you know, some of the questions to some of my clients offshore uh, from, from my clients offshore is like, we want to know and understand that and actually if that's the type of organisation that you're describing and we are aligned, then we're willing to co-invest into spaces about growing those capabilities. So it's not necessarily um, a bank or um, um, you know, a government or what have you on this side um, of a trade deal. Um, sometimes actually the policy that you're writing and the ability to bring forward indigeneity in trade actually opens the door for lots of avenues. And optionality is a real key when we're going through quite, tumult situa quite a tumultuous situation in, in global markets at the moment and around geopolitics. So, mm. kia ora. Um, I might just, speaking of last word again, I might just... Uh, uh, now I actually finish, on, finish at the right time. Uh, just give uh, one last opportunity. Um, we'll sweep along this way. So any sort of final reflections for the audience? Okay, so this is my big bugbear. <laughs> if I haven't already put all the bugbears on the table, this is my big bugbear. And it really is the way that it's become a convention to group in indigenous people with women, young people, MSMEs, and persons with disabilities. That's not to say all those groups of people um, and, and aren't important to all trade agreements from an inclusion side. What I think, and what I, you know, what's really important to understand is that indigenous people have their own political, legal, cultural um, relationships. They have a land base, and we have um, we have a cultural identity in our own language. So these are things that are separate from those other. Um, how do we put it, uh, marginalised groups in society. So we are our own society. We are f our First Nations. And I just think it's a really um, frustrating convention that's starting to happen globally because what we're starting to see is words like traditional communities, local communities all come up and it really kind of disempowers that notion that was fought so hard for, for us to be recognised as Indigenous peoples. So I just want when you go forward... <laughs> in your um, policy careers and in your conversations, and even if you don't agree with me right now, start to check that, like start to question why are we doing this? Because it really, 
um, makes an important difference that Indigenous people aren't categorised um, in that way. We have a special and unique status because of that, uh, that land base and that kind of sovereignty and right to self-determination that is underpinned in the um, underip. And I just really want people to make sure that going forward, whether they agree with me or not, they at least start to question whether or not that should be the right grouping. Kia ora. Kia ora. Let's shift the language from marginalised to manorised. <laughs> I just thought that one up. Sorry. <laughs> save the applause. Save the applause. <laughs> um, in terms of Indigenous leadership, I want to come back to my key message was the message that I started with, which is that partnership is really critical. Um, often as Indigenous representatives um, invited into discussions where decisions take place, um, we are, a question is put to us, and it's as though, as the Indigenous leader, you're supposed to know exactly then and there um, all the solutions, you know, like, I think about um, a recent climate change forum that I was <laughs> invited on, um, I won't name the agency, um, and they go, all right, um, what, is, what, are, what are all the issue, climate change is, issues that you're facing as Māori, and what are the solutions, because we want to enable them, and, um, you know, we go, well, we're, we're currently facing some climate um, issues that we're aware of, but we don't even know um, what, what issues we're going to face um, in the forthcoming, in the foreseeable future, let alone the future we can't even see yet, because you don't even know them. So if you don't know them and you've got all that sophisticated modelling around um, all of the data that you've collected from Māori and non-Māori communities, then how are we supposed to know them? <laughs> you know, like, what are the impacts going to be on your native species? How do we know? How are we supposed to know? Um, we were projecting in 2017... Uh, a climate change report was commissioned by one of our Crown Research Institutes from a Māori perspective. And it was exactly for that reason. What are the issues we are facing? Um, what are the challenges that we were pro probably going to see? What are the solutions that we need? In 2017, we projected that the primary issue that we would face would be drought. Um, I have a house down here in Parnell, and at Cyclone Gabriel, my house was like, the, the bottom floor is completely flooded out. My have, I have clients on the Ruatoria, Waiapu, it's the Waiapu catchment in Ruatoria, the east coast, right, um, around Gizzi, who, who in 2017 we were projecting that one in 100 year um, extreme weather events causing flooding would happen once every five years. They have had a significant flooding event five times in the last um, 12 months. Right? And we know what that is doing to the Waiapu catchment um, and the devastation to the, not only the natural environment with the slash that's coming down from the forestry, which is a big trader, you know, um, the forestry industry in New Zealand, and that those, those are Māori-owned forests as well, you know, um, to their communities and the infrastructure. My friend who is the chair of um, Greenpeace New Zealand, who is also... Um, on the board of Ngāti Pirau, Runanga, and um, lives at Ruatoria, champion, championing um, the remediation efforts, came to join me at New Zealand Fishing Week, as you do, you know, recently in Auckland. Um, what would normally be a six-hour trip took something like eight hours, and she did it in 12 um, from Ruatoria. So what I'm saying is... <sighs> We don't know at the time that you don't know. N normally we don't know either. <laughs> we can only tell you what we're experiencing. Our um, science as Mātauranga Māori is often experiential. You know, it, We will know when we experience those things with our natural environment. So that's one of the key reasons why um, we need to continue to be at the table with you and we need to not only have part a partner dialogue, but we need to co-develop the right solution and co-design it as well. So it's not a one-off conversation, it needs to be an enduring conversation. We're not a working group that is engaged by a particular agency for a 30-hour um, you know, contract or period to glean all of the answers and then produce the policy response. We have to be at the table on an enduring basis over the, um, for the duration to get the real and correct and ticker and right um, policy approach, so partnership. I think just to say that um, if I can help you in your job um, to either share what I'm seeing or hearing or connect you, just reach out. See you at work. Nice. Um, and with that, can I ask you once again uh, a warm round of applause. Thank you very much. Kia ora koutou.